right now you can prototype things so much more quickly than you can 10 years ago that it's a, it's just a different ball game. So let's get into it. Um, hey guys, we got another episode of the one podcast here with Tommy from Green Badger. Um, I'm psyched for this one. We have a lot of SaaS companies, um, Tommy, in our kind of accelerator. One thing we're trying to push is like, finding niches that are kind of not, you know, sparsely occupied or have like low competition. I think what you've done with Green Badge in the construction industry uh, is pretty interesting, especially for the amount of time that you've done it. Um, but for the audience of early stage entrepreneurs, would be entrepreneurs, can you kind of give a quick background to yourself and, um, you know, your backstory? Sure. And I appreciate being here, Chris. Uh, again, I'm Tommy Lindstroth. I'm founder of Green Badger. We're a SaaS platform for automating green construction compliance. So my background's in sustainability. I uh, came from real estate development where I was the director of sustainability for a developer here. I'm in Savannah, Georgia. We did stuff throughout the Southeast and had committed that everything we designed, built, managed, and operated would be done as, as sustainably as possible. So really cut my teeth with our, our own development dollars, figuring out how do you design and construct these green buildings. From there, moved into consulting because a lot of other people were asking, how do you go about doing that? Um, so I was working as consulting and then really came into, into technology, I think how a lot of people did, which is I had my own problems, my own struggles managing things. I was looking for a better way to do it, found out there wasn't one. And so, you know, built a solution to my own headache. And so I really launched Green Badger to, to solve my trouble of how do you manage green construction, a process that goes on for, for years and years and get out of the uh, manual spreadsheet era into the digital era? And here we are. Nice. So I guess to before we get into the individual industry and some of the challenges there, um, just like a question I ask everybody, were you always kind of an entrepreneur lemonade stand you know, type person or, or did you always think of starting your own business or how did that kind of come about for you? You know, I can't say when I was a kid, I was going to look at myself as an adult and say I'd be having my own business, but I was definitely nice. entrepreneurial from the early age, whether it was selling friendship bracelets on the bus to, you know, I was super early into, into baseball cards and had my own, you know, table at these baseball card shows when I was like, big business. Old. I was great um, to, you know, uh, going through and, and, and digging through uh, construction dumpsters and pulling out aluminum cans so I could go in and sell them for a buck. And so, yeah, long, long history of doing that. Started my own consulting firm before moving into this. So certainly have been, uh, have, had the bug from an early age. Nice. So let's, I guess, get into like the consulting firm first. So you had a couple roles, I guess, or you were involved in the professionally in the construction industry with the green side of it. Like what, at what point are you thinking about, you know, starting a consulting company or going out on your own? Sure. So really, you know, we were, I was doing it for a real estate developer uh, and we had started doing some consulting for them. Again, this was, you know, 20, 15 years ago. And, and at the time we were doing it for free because it was really, we, we were figuring out how to build green and we thought everybody else should too. So when people asked, how do you do it? We were, we were helping them. And then I was like, all right, well, we should really start to monetize this. Um, and then that was in 2009, the, you know, the real estate crash hit. And so that company, Face some challenges. So at that time, it was better just to go on my own and, and do consulting. So that was really the pivot to that. Did you, I guess, have uh, some, I mean, obviously the real estate crash, that whole thing, but you had some clients and connections, I guess, queued up from your previous professional experience to start that? Yeah. Fortunately, I was able to walk in with a book of business and, and get going. And then nice. just you know, cont continue to, we had, we had a unique perspective uh, because we came from the owner's side. So a lot of times, you know, you get in consultants and everything's a great idea that because you're not paying for it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> some of came, came grounded in that, well, we've tried this. I've personally tried got this it. and seen it work or this didn't work. So always had a unique perspective for the projects I got involved with. So in terms of like the services, like, so I guess you're saying that, that because you were on the owner's side, you had... I guess you had like a pre uh, an idea of like what you would be providing. It wasn't something where you're going in and you're trial and error, you know, through like exactly. Years. I don't want to say it was formulaic, but it was. You know, we could certainly give give an insight, especially to an owner, if they're going to hold this asset for a little while. That well, in five years from now, is this really something you're going to want to be dealing with? Because you know, I've tried that and it was kind of a pain in the butt. Nice. 
Um, so I guess at what point, and you're still doing the consulting stuff today to some degree, like that company's still around, right? Uh, the company's still around just as an entity, but I'm not doing anything with it. Uh, we do provide some professional services through Green Badger, but it's a, it's a small portion of our overall business. Got it. So at what point are you thinking about, like, at what point are you thinking about doing a software company? Like, did you have developers around, like software developers around, or how did you, you know, I know you're not a technical founder, so how did that kind of like software component come up? It really started with just one idea that, you know, I was going to these job sites and you'd have to verify is the paint they're using going to kill you or not? And it's like, you drove an hour to a job site, you're walking around, you're sweating, you're picking up a five gallon bucket of paint, trying to read this little fine print. And it's like, all right, if these guys could just scan this barcode and, and figure out if this paint they should use was good or not, it would save a trip and a lot of sweat and tears. And so uh, I worked with just a local developer who I got put in contact through for a referral to build a really basic app that was just, hey, we're going to create a database of products based on barcodes and you'll scan them and it'll tell you, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. And then once I had that, then it really just opened my eyes to, okay, well, you could manage all of your products. You could do all these inspections, all of these things we're harping on that need to get done at construction sites, you could, you could do. And so I started working with that developer. It ended up being, you know, a little much for their cap capabilities. Um, so tried out uh, another, we did, did an RFP and talked to a couple developers, um, went down that road. It unfortunately imploded, um, but then I had gotten referred to another group who I've been, been working with. Uh, for the past eight or so years, which has been great. So certainly, you know, you can do this without being a technical co-founder. Uh, certainly, my first bit of advice would be do your diligence with, you know, I get a, 10 emails a day now about, yeah. hey, outsource your development and we've got all of these the capabilities. Software, and software. Make sure you take your time to really vet some partners and, and try and get people who are, you can really uh, see what their work has been before you jump yeah. in bed with them. Yeah, that's, I mean, for your particular niche, like, was it something that was like super cost intensive or time intensive, like the development side of it, like APIs and that type of thing, or what were the technical requirements like more basic? It was a little bit more basic back then. Again, this was, you know, we started this process in 2014, 2015. There's so many more low code solutions that you can go with. I mean, Rao, if you want to prototype something, you don't even have to I was drawing it on the back of a piece of paper, right? Now you can just go into right. any of these Envision, Figma. You can literally build your entire Wire web app no. and hand it over, which is, again, the best way you do technical specifications. It's like if you're working with an outsourced group, give them exactly what you want so that there's no question. So, I mean, right now you can prototype things so much more quickly than you can 10 years ago that it's a, it's just a different ballgame. Yeah. Yeah, and I think even as a non-technical founder, just familiarizing yourselves with that makes you able better to communicate with the dev team and, and stuff like that. Does it, has that been kind of your experience as well? Sorry, you cut out. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, no, I was just saying, so I think familiarizing yourself as a non-technical founder with like the wireframing, the prototyping tools, it makes you better able to communicate with the, the dev team, like as the founder and person kind of running the idea side of it. So I'm wondering if yeah. you had that kind of, you know, did, did like writing the stuff out on a piece of paper, right? Like have your impact, your communication with that team. It was, uh, it enhanced it and they, they wanted that as well. So, I mean, we had full visual wireframes as well as narratives of what does what where. So it was very clear and it's had a collaborative Google doc that you could share it all in. And that basically now serves as the repository. If a new developer comes on board, they have a, they have a wiki basically of everything of what the software does, why it does it, how it should be doing it. So that they can self onboard and educate themselves of how it's, what it's supposed to be doing. So it's been a consistent team, the whole kind of, you know, it has, you've been it has, you know, I've been fortunate to, to work with the, uh, developers. a great, uh, great partner. Um, that again, has really been, been like just part of the green badger team for the last eight, nine years. And uh, so, Count, count, fingers crossed uh, that it continues going that way. But I've got a lot of a lot of faith in the team. They nice. you know are working full time on on the product, um, and they're they're just invested cool. as much invested in our success as we are. So it's great. So I guess shifting gears, how are you, you know are you selling the product in the early days? I guess to your existing client base, or like how are you thinking about sales and marketing, the book of business, all that type of stuff with a software company versus consulting. 
Sure. So the upside is coming from the industry. You know, a lot of the people that I needed to talk to were, were peers, and they were they were people I've you know spoken on panels with, or we go to the same trade shows and conferences. So I was able to have a lot of warm intros, or at least people willing to take my call and un, and hear what I was doing, and a lot of it really being able to speak their language. Like I knew exactly how they were managing this. There was no no secret way that they were doing it. It's like, guys, look, I know you're using these ridiculous spreadsheets, like everybody's doing it. So you know, help me speak the language of my customer. It really definitely knew the customer problem and the customer pain points. And then it gave me those first inroads to get those early customers where then you could go say, okay, well, we're working with, you know, th these, this company and this company, this company, you know, give it, give us a chance. And then we moved into sort of the colder, colder outreach, but at least we had customers that we were able to then go and use that as our inroad. What is that? What's the biggest, is there co competition, like strong competition or like, what's the biggest challenge, I guess, getting people on board with the software? Our biggest challenge, especially in the early days was just changing the status quo. We weren't trying to say, use our software over the one you're currently using. We're trying to say, look, stop using spreadsheets. Like it was a process change. It was education as much as anything. It wasn't my Apple phone's better than your Android because it can do these different features. It was like, you're using a landline and we're trying to get you on a cell phone. So early days, it was just a lot of, they'd been doing this for 25 years, right? In spreadsheets, literally 25 years, the process had not changed. And now we came in to interject a completely new way in doing it. And even when it was better, you know, they're still like, I, I know what I know versus I, I know what I don't know, even if it looks nicer. So that was really our biggest challenge, not that, we weren't, didn't have a problem we were solving. It's just, I'm so comfortable with my pain that I'm going to keep using it. Yeah. So knowing that you were competing against the status quo, I mean, how did you think about pricing? Pricing or we was just made, pricing difficult? We're, still, we're still underpriced. We never wanted price to be a reason somebody could say no. And frankly, in the industry at the time, you know, we talked to a lot of people early and they're like, I could just make this poor, you know, kid fresh out of school work 80 hours a week because I'll just lock them in the job trailer. Like, I don't care if I save them 30 hours a week, I, I'll just make them work more. So we, we definitely faced some of that a little bit. So we didn't want it to be where they would say, well, I can't afford it and I'm just gonna throw hours at it. So we priced ourselves very inexpensively so that price would not be a barrier. And you know, we, have, we had our first price increase uh, really last year in 2023 and we're, we're still probably a little bit underpriced, but you know, I'm still a little bit on that board. We don't want price to be a barrier to mass adoption here. Do customers or prospects self on board or do you have to do demos and kind of like a standard sales process? For, each uh, for, for sales, we still do. I mean, if it's a new, completely new customer, we've got about a 10 minute demo that walks them through. And again, typically after that, they're like, sign me up. In terms of onboarding, if they haven't used it, um, we do an hour to an hour and a half onboarding session just because oh, wow. okay. we just never want somebody to not use the software correctly and have a bad experience and say they're not going to use this again because they didn't understand how to use it. So while it's completely into it's super intuitive, but it's, you know, construction teams have so many fires they're putting out and, and green compliance tends to be yeah. low and often gets forgot about and pushed to the side. So we really want to just make sure that the solution is working for them and they're they're able to to use it. Now once they've used it once, all of our repeat customers, they just call us up and say, hey, we got another project, get us going. They they need nothing. But for brand new Teams, we do do that Got hour it. onboarding. Got it. So I know that you obviously have to keep all the materials updated just because like the laws change and the environment changes and whatnot. But what, is there like a lot of upkeep associated with each customer? Or I mean, you kind of got into it a little bit there, but is it heavy on the upkeep or no? No, after that, they're pretty much on cruise control. I mean, we reach out nice. and just see if they've got questions along the way. We also really spent the time to invest in the most detailed FAQ we could. We've got a video and a narrative for every single question I've ever been asked. Like if they don't yeah, know how to notice that, yeah, 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 they can go click the FAQ and in less than 10 seconds, watch a video on, on, on their specific question. So that reduces the them calling our customer support as well as you know, they can get an instant answer at their fingertips while they're in the application. Got it. Got it. So I guess leading from that, what is the, you know, customer lifetime value or like, how's, how do you deal with churn? I mean, you mentioned some of the things there, like the resources, but I'm just trying to think how you think about that overall. Sure. So we're a little bit different because we're heavily project based. So being in construction, you know, not every project has a green requirement. Got so it. 
we're at a project by project basis. So our, our retention when is great by company, but it's not always necessarily the same team because if they do move on to a project that doesn't have a green requirement, you know, we, we don't have really a, a value proposition for them, but repeat business is our number one source of business. And then uh, referral within those companies is our number two. So it is definitely, people tend to be pretty happy and stick around and we can show if they use us for one project, they'll use us for five, they'll use us, use us for 20 as we grow our relationship with them. Have you ever considered, I guess, um, branching off or adding new products? Yeah, it's on our roadmap and we hope to launch three or four of them here this year. So we had to pay a bit of tech Got debt it. back in 2023 because we were growing, uh, you know, we, when you're building, especially when you're small and you don't have a ton of resources, you don't take the time to refactor and do some of the things you'd, you'd normally do. So we had a lot of tech debt that we paid back last year. Um, and this year we're, we're diving back in. So we're going to have multiple other uh, green certifications our system manages, as well as uh, hopefully some stronger third-party integrations to really expand our revenue opportunities, as well as just expand our usefulness to our customer base. Have you ever thought about like doing a side venture or something kind of loosely related to Green Badger, like another sp a spin-off of another software company, or maybe, you know, investing in another company, like just as an entrepreneur overall? Uh, it's, it's in the thought process, but honestly, I'm so nose to the grindstone because we are still, you know, we're, we're pretty small, so I don't get my blinders off too, too much. You to, can't take to, them to, off. No. Um, what are some like the, the biggest challenges, I guess you're, you're dealing with now kind of 10 years in, um, anything with like HR personal, um, you know, the team, what's, what are the biggest difficulties of, you know, running this type of business? Sure. So getting the right fit, you know, we're small uh, still. So people you hire have a, have a, can have an oversized impact. So just making sure we went through that process and, you know, we've, we've done the try and hire on your own. We've used a recruiter, uh, which helped yeah. like that process was, was the best for us. So, you know, I would say really think about how you're hiring and investing in hiring because the money you spend on your people, you know, is going to pay dividends because they're going to be there and they're really the driver of your organization. Uh, we haven't gotten to the size where we've had a huge, you know, necessary need to go the HR route. Um, you know, one of the things we we continue to do is is outsource a lot of that, and that'd certainly be a, a piece of advice. Whether it's sales, whether it's marketing, you know, whether it's your software. In today's day and age, I mean, you can find an outside partner. Again, you've got to vet them, and it's great to get referrals in of people that are tried and trusted. But if you're trying to be capital efficient, you know, do you necessarily need somebody? Do you need a full-time finance person or can you use a fractional CFO? Can you use somebody to do your invoicing for you? Most of the times those answers are yes. And so you can really ease into your growth by outsourcing until it's time where you find you need that full, full-time person. Nice. Uh, do you have any channel partnerships with like non-competitive, I guess, SaaS companies where they're referring people in and and like we're just kicking this off. So this is Q1 of 2024. Uh, we've got our first one or two where we're, we're doing it both formally and informally. So uh, it's been interesting because we're a lot of, you know, you've got your, your accelerator. Uh, we're in a couple of just ecosystems for construction. And you talk to these guys and girls and they're, you're selling to the same people and you're selling completely different things, but it's the same people. So we're like, why are we sure. all doing it independently? Let's at least informally be aware. So while well, you do drone camera augmentation. Great. That's never going to be anything to do with me. But if my customer needs that, I'd love to pass you on. Um, so we're, we are just starting that process now because we are selling into the same audience with completely different products. And it just makes sense to to try and share those inroads because that's the, the hardest part is getting your foot in the door with some of these companies. Nice. So I guess throughout this whole journey, both with the consulting firm and, and Green Badger, um, anything, any kind of like overarching lessons that you might have not thought about going in that have kind of come up that you think are useful to other people who are doing so? Uh, I mean, there's a couple, I, you know, I think that everyone thinks you need to run out and raise money and there's an awful lot you can do without having to raise outside capital. And because if you haven't raised capital, once you do, and you have a board and you have people with other expectations that are aligned for their their and their investments interests versus perhaps the way you want to do things you know that's something to be something to be aware of i'm in, i'm in a pretty good situation we had raised a pre-seed round and everything's been good with our investors but it's you know as you as you look at your growth and uh, what you want to do you don't have to go raise money and if you want to and it helps yeah. it's, but you know don't think that there's only 
one path forward and it's go and, and try and raise a bunch of money and uh, lose money until you make money type of thing. Yeah. Or it, I, I guess good advice seems to be like, just try to build the business first. And then if you have to raise money, do it rather than just like thinking about putting the money, I guess, or, or the fundraise ahead of the business building stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly a balance in, in which one you go for here. Cool. Um, what about in terms of, uh, you know, like sales and marketing, anything, anything that came up like a initiative that failed badly or one that worked particularly well? I think it all depends. A lot of it is just understanding your audience and the things that they, the like or don't. Um, you know, we work with a lot of contractors and, you know, we try to, we, we partnered with somebody to do cold calls and somebody who was calling like 60 or 70 people a day and it really was not effective. And our audience is on a job site dealing with subcontractors, putting out fires, like they're going to take time out of their day and say, yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about this and do a demo. It's like, all right, that's, right. that's just not, yeah. that's not, I mean, nobody likes getting a cold call, but it's uh, when you're on the 33rd floor of a under construction building and you're trying to get your plumber to show up and then you get a call from Green Badger, <laughs> like that's not ideal. Cool. So, you know, it's, it's understanding where your audience is and what nice. is you know, what's going to be an effective means of reaching them. And, and some are going to work and some aren't depending on, what your what your sector is. Gotcha. You know, you were mentioning before, like the resources and all the, you know, like all the documentation materials that you did. I know that you've done like a lot of content marketing, kind of like newsletters, webinars and stuff, stuff like that. Have you found that people in kind of your niche are eager consumers of that content? Uh, and like, have you found that type of stuff to be like very helpful as far as customer acquisition or more so on the retention and just enablement end? It's definitely on the acquisition. So the upside, and I would, especially for a startup, you know, fully endorse content marketing as does do most people because it's free, right? It's your own knowledge that you're formulating and putting out there. Now, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the asset themselves. It's the SEO around it. So if somebody's Googling, how do I read a lead scorecard? We're the first thing that comes up because we've got a resource on how do you read this scorecard? Um, and so we put out a ton of a ton of that. And content marketing is a, I mean, the industry needs this information. We're not putting out fluff pieces. We're putting out quality information based on years of practical hands-on experience. So it's super useful and it helps people find us. And when they read that resource and then they're like, where did I get this from? Oh, okay, man. All right, well, let me see what you do. Okay, well, now I understand why why I'm on this site. So certainly it's a, it's a great way to get out there and showcase your own expertise and your value. And you know, rather than cold calling somebody and asking something from them, give them something, provide them a resource, give them some information that makes their day better. And now more likelihood they're going to come around and, and be receptive to what your message is. So what's the, you know, I going off that point in the whole thing with cold calling, what do you see as like kind of the, for the next like five or 10 years, you're just like, dominating the market or becoming more of a late stage company like what it what do you see as like the predominant channels like is it just still f just focusing on understanding that customer persona and consistently like educating them or do you have like some kind of master plan idea of like what the next phase is for you guys <laughs> Uh, so we're looking uh, again to our, our next phase is we, we want the end game is that we want to be the central platform for anything green construction related. So that could be uh, at the subcontractor level. That could be where we are at the GC level. There's you know a, a number of other uh, rating schemes in the U.S. There's international ones. I mean, we've got uh, a, long, a long plan of things that we want to do so that if there's anything in that's sustainability related in construction, we've got a solution for you. And it's a growing niche, I think. You know, every, we're seeing more of these requirements everywhere, which we need it to be. You know, I'm a tree hugger, so I certainly think we need more of them faster. But yeah. um, we want we want to be the one stop shop for all those. We want to integrate with the pro cores and the auto desks so that we can play nice with whatever ecosystem that our, our users are operating in. Um, and yeah, if there's a green requirement on a construction project, we want Green Badger to be the solution. Got it. Um, I guess tying everything together. Last question, like what's the biggest change from running the company what you know when you had started in 2013 14 15 versus today as a, uh, as now a, i don't have to do everything so i mean in 2014 and 15 i was 
doing every proposal. I was sending every invoice. I was doing collections. I was doing every training. I was doing every customer support call. Um, again, it was tiny. It was me and one other person on the operations side. Uh, and she was great and she helped do all of our graphic design and our content pieces, but I was, I was doing all of that. Now we've got a great team. Um, we've got a great uh, sales lead who does all our demos. We've got a, an outside partner doing all of our invoicing and collections. Uh, we've got a great customer success person for all of our onboardings. It allows me to still have my, uh, my blinders on of, of the day to the day and I'm in the weeds an awful lot, but it does let me take a little bit of that step back, which you need to do to, nice. to stay strategic you know, and, and keep your head above it a little bit. So fortunate to grow enough to have a, a great team around me that can help just diversify the workload a little bit. Cool. Tommy, where can uh, people find you and how do they get in touch if they're in the industry and they want to sign up? Go to getgreenbadger.com or following us on all of the normal socials, but getgreenbadger.com for all of the info as well as all of, all of the great content. Nice. Cool. Tommy, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me. Are you ready? Welcome. Uh, now I'm basically starting a new company, which is going to be an app market.